And so let me um, give you all a little orientation as to how we ended up all being here this morning. So some of us have been um, going into iNaturalist, looking at the um, um, bumblebee observations that had been posted uh, 2020 and earlier, um, looking at the, the uh, flower associations and adding that to a field in iNaturalist, so just to try to get a sense for what our bumblebees foraging on and have been observed on in, um, in Ohio. And so we've been playing with that kind of late spring, uh, winter and late spring, and so when we um, got together, uh, I think a couple months ago, and we're talking about bumblebees and foraging and folks had questions. And I said, oh, let me get with Jamie and see if um, Jamie Strange, who is a bumblebee researcher and expert professor now at OSU and the uh, chair of our entomology department, let me see if Jamie can, Jamie can join us and um, kind of talk about bumblebee foraging, you know, what they're looking for, what plants are offering, and uh, maybe answer some of our questions. So um, Jamie was gracious enough to, um, to put us in his busy calendar. So Jamie, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks so much for, uh, so I did open it, Jamie, just so you know. So some of these folks are, are um, those who are volunteering to help with the iNaturalist project, but I also opened it wider to um, a list of folks who came in last year and did a lot of online pollinator projects. Most all, I think everybody's from, um, from Ohio. So just to give you a feel for, for who's there. And uh, again, Jamie, thanks so much for um, joining us. Um, uh, so I have um, I prepared a mercifully short slide deck here. I've got, I think, 11 slides. So uh, it's not too much. And um, I'm going to I'll just run through them. Basically, um, I'll share my screen and you can see the slideshow. But it's uh, I'm going to touch on a um, little bit of bumblebee biology, just give you a little background and then um, talk a little bit about some of the uh, how essentially bumblebees choose plants to forage on. And then um, you'll see throughout here there's a. Uh, and then I'll go through a couple experiments, some of which were from my research group and other groups that I've worked with and you know, uh, other just other people in the field that are doing stuff. So talk a little bit about some of the research that's kind of ongoing and, um, and happened. And you'll, I think it'll be um, useful for you and that you'll see a lot of plant names, uh, specifically a lot of plant family names. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, but which I'll explain as we go, but, um, and then there's a few, uh, you'll see some species things, and then we can, then I'll just open it up and we can have a discussion about kind of, I have a lot of anecdotal observations about bees on flowers um, and, and where to find them. Um, and I, I can try to answer stuff as much as possible. And I will throw this caveat out there. While I am an expert on bumblebees, I, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know about how they, choose flowers, what flowers they prefer to go to, why they make the decisions they make. We've studied it many times. Um, and sometimes we think we've got a handle on certain things and other things uh, we don't. So uh, I'll throw that out there. You may hear me say, I don't know. And um, uh, we'll go with that because there's a lot of stuff I don't know. So I'm going to try to share my screen. And I want to share this one. Can you? Oops, that's not the one I want. I don't think. Are you seeing the slide presentation? Uh, yes, bumblebees, two sixty three plus species. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna do this and see if this helps. All right. Looks good. All right. So, um, yeah, just a quick uh, little background of bumblebees. Worldwide, 263 plus species. I think this is now 264 because about a week ago, another paper came out um, describing a, another species, actually this one in Western North America, in, mostly in Canada. Um, and uh, so so the numbers go up. Mostly what I think, you, it's not like we're really finding um, unique bumblebees so much as that we're looking at the species we know that are out there and people are then doing molecular work um, and more detailed ecological studies and finding out that some things that look alike are actually multiple species. So, um, so this number goes up a bit. 
Uh, these bees are largely grouped, uh, the bumblebees are largely grouped into 15 subgenera. Um, those within the genus Bombus, we divide it up because of these groupings that sort of make sense. Um, morphologically, the bees uh, look similar uh, and they're, they also have similar ecological habits, um, which is probably important in, in what they eat. Um, and also nesting habits, uh, things like that. And then, um, so, so we break them up. It makes it a little easier for us to think about them and how they behave in different ways. Um, there are 50 species with the recent um, division of uh, the Western bumblebee, uh, Bombus occidentalis. The, I mentioned the new species is called Bombus micaei. I don't think it has a common name um, at the moment, uh, but it, uh, that's our 50th in North America, north of Mexico. If we include um, Central America, then we add about 13 species to that number. So, um, you know, from the, the Panama Canal North, we're looking at um, something like 63 species of bumblebees. Uh, so this map just shows, this is from Paul Williams' uh, website on, uh, on bumblebees. He's with the uh, National uh, Natural History Museum of London. Um, and this, what these numbers are in the little boxes uh, where it says 31, that's 31 species that occur in that region. Um, and so you can see that, you know, in, in the Great Lakes region, we have somewhere between 22, uh, Southern Great Lakes were somewhere between 20 and, and 21 species, 22 species maybe, um, that historically have been found in these areas. And some, some of those bees ranges have shifted and Habitats have changed a little bit, so they're not always um, not always going to be all those species in any one given place. In fact, in most places, you're you know likely to find four or five species that are fairly common um, and uh, and abundant, and then um, often a number of pretty rare species at those sites. So uh, most of the species would be you'd be unlikely to run into unless you're in a really um, habitat that's friendly for that that one particular species and we don't always know what drives those things we just um it's probably a combination of both food sources and uh climate and things like that but uh the the most diverse area for bumblebee species is the himalayas uh and uh, or northern um northern himalayas there's about 70 species that occur uh in in uh the most uh dense species dense area here in, in Asia. So fortunately, we don't have to remember 70 species. We just have our, our 20 or so that we have to, to know here. Um, this is a bumblebee life cycle. This, this little beauty here is um, uh, hunt bumblebee, Bombus huntii. Uh, it's a common Western species. Uh, I used to do a lot of work on this when I was out in Utah. And so most of my pictures are, are of this because I also think it's one of the prettiest bumblebees you can see. Um, Bumblebees are primitively eusocial. This is important in understanding the foods they select because uh, they need to feed a colony throughout the season uh, and they need, they have different needs. Um, this is, you know, the queens will emerge in spring. And actually, I, I just saw a, a, a common Eastern bumblebee, uh, Bombus and Patience Queen, um, searching for a nest site in my yard over the weekend. So there still are queens out and about at this time of year. They're just finding nest sites. Most most of them I would say have probably found a nest site at this point, but some are still nest searching. Uh, they're going to um, find a spot, they're gonna provision it with pollen and some nectar. Uh, and here's a little lump of pollen in this nest. And then there's these two little lumps here. These are egg masses that the queen, here's the queen, that she has laid on this mass of pollen. This will grow over the next um, several weeks uh, and it'll get bigger and bigger. Uh, workers will emerge from those nests. Uh, the, from, from the cells here in the nest, these are each a, a cell that a worker developed in, these open ones, and then these are developing uh, larvae in the big lumps. Uh, and that nest will grow, it'll get much bigger. Um, common Eastern bumblebee, the nest may reach a thousand individuals um, uh, by the end of the summer, and um, it'll grow new males and new queens will emerge at the uh, end of the growing season, they'll mate. Uh, everybody dies off uh, in the fall except for the mated queens. Those mated queens um, will find a wintering site, usually below the surface of the soil uh, or in some other protected area, and they will um, undergo the winter uh, by themselves. 
And then in the spring, they'll reemerge next year and they'll start the cycle all over again. Um, and these are annual colony cycles. So we call it primitively used social, unlike honeybees, which have a perennial colony cycle. They never run out of workers. They always have some workers in the colony. Uh, and so we call those um, highly used social. So um, the used social just designates that there's a queen uh, and there's workers and that they divide labor up within the colony. Um, the, these bumblebees have this solitary and social phases. And in fact, you know, the queens are gonna be feeding on some things that perhaps workers uh, are never really even exposed to. And so diets can vary um, over the, the course of the year based on who's out foraging and why they're foraging. And in fact, in the fall or late summer, you may see males out foraging as well. Um, and males typically aren't even foraging for nectar for pollen, they're only foraging for nectar. And so they may choose different flowers as well. So that can be driving some of what you see on flowers. Um, this is from uh, Anthony Baudo and, and his uh, PhD research that he did at Penn State a few years ago. Um, the, it, it essentially talks about like what uh, the, the things are used for. So, um, you know, nectar is uh, sugar, it's, it's sugar in water that plants produce. So they secrete it and they can secrete it from nectaries and flowers. And there's also extra floral nectaries that occur on plants that may not even be on the flower, but somewhere else in the plant where they're excreting. Um, uh, something sweet that the bees are attracted to and they'll forage on. This is energy for foraging, and that's why they're going for nectar. Um, honeybees, if you know about honeybees, you know, they're foraging for nectar, and they're also, it is essentially energy to contribute to foraging and to contribute to the maintenance of the nest. Uh, and they're going to store a whole bunch, but, but because honeybees um, need to survive the winter as a, a colony, they have to store a lot. So they store a lot of nectar um, in the form of concentrated nectar in the form of honey in their colonies. And that's to get them through the winter. Bumblebees aren't surviving the winter as a colony. It's just a single queen who's going essentially, essentially hibernating, right? So she doesn't eat during that winter period. So she doesn't need to store large amounts of, of these carbohydrates. Uh, and so you'll see in a bumblebee nest very little um, honey storage or even nectar storage. They'll concentrate it a little bit. They will keep some in there. It's a sort of a rainy day fund, literally for a rainy day or two when they can't forage, um, but they don't store large amounts to get through periods of dearth. So if there's not nectar flowing, you tend to see a real drop off in, in bumblebee activity because uh, they need that constant income of nectar in order to keep going. Pollen, on the other hand, is, is used, pollen is, is, you know, it's the male gamete of plants um, of, and, uh, you know, bees have, the bees in general have evolved with angiosperms to, you know, to take advantage of pollen, both as a, as moving it for pollination, but also eating it. Uh, and they consume it mostly in the larval stages. So adults will forage, they'll bring pollen back, they'll feed it to the larvae, the larvae develop, uh, pupate, and then become adults. Um, and that's where like a lot of these micronutrients, there's proteins, there's lipids, pollen is really a complex uh, thing. So uh, there are various reasons why, um, why bees would want this. And then this rest of this is just essentially um, saying that, you know, phenology, nesting are important in combination with these nutritional sources and, and, um, and that stable plant communities and stable bee communities are very tightly linked um, because uh, bees are needed for that pollination service and plants are needed for the food. Um, and so uh, you have, if, if you have, if you tend to have a stable plant community, then you can have a stable bee community as well. Um, bumblebees themselves are, are dietary generalists. So you see them on a lot of different plants. And I had this comment here of majors and minors. Uh, and, and what I, you know, sort of thinking about our, our grad students or rather our undergraduate students here who, who will major in, uh, we might get a lot of students who major in biology, but they'll have a minor in entomology. And that's a lot of what um, bumblebees do is they'll have plants that they really seem to prefer and they go to a lot, but then they go to a lot of um, other things much in a much rarer um, circumstance. So uh, they just don't go there quite as frequently. And so the bulk of what they're bringing into the colony will be one or two plant sources at a time uh, but they're also sampling other things that are out there uh, to a lesser degree. Bumblebees are buzz pollinators, meaning that they can um, access uh, 
excess uh, pollen from porocytal anthers. So if there's an anther that has these little pores in it where the pollen is inside of those, the bees will bite onto the flower, they'll vibrate their uh, flight muscles, uh, and that will shake the flower with this buzzing sound. Um, and that'll cause the pollen to fall out of those um, porocyte, those pores on the anthers. Um, so they can access more pollen uh, more efficiently than a lot of other bees that don't have this behavior. Honeybees, for example, don't buzz pollinate. So bumblebees is, are thought to be better pollinators of plants that have these uh, these kind of anthers. Um, things like tomatoes. Uh, so a lot of the solanaceous plants have this. They, uh, the other thing about solanaceous plants is they tend not to produce much uh, nectar. And so, um, so honeybees typically stay away from them, whereas bumblebees really like these plants and, and are, are very good at extracting pollen from them. Um, and, and so these are considered, bumblebees are considered highly, highly efficient pollinators for most, uh, most plants that they visit. And you can see here, here's pictures of bumblebees on a various numbers thing. This is a white clover. Um, here's a tomato plant. Uh, this is a, a lupin. Uh, this is a water leaf hydrophyllum, um, some, some spring lilies, and, uh, and this is a penstemon. So just a variety of things that the bumblebees can be witnessed on. Um, I'm gonna move ahead of this because I've got a better slide coming up in a minute, but bumblebees are uh, important crop pollinators. <clears throat> and uh, the value recently estimated is, I think this number was from about six years ago, was there's about $609 um, million of tomatoes in the US. Uh, that number is probably greater now. Uh, and bumblebees are the primary pollinator of those, especially in greenhouse situations. Um, a lot of our tomatoes, especially those we eat in the winter, are grown in greenhouses and bumblebees are sold, produced and sold in the uh, commercial colonies as pollinators for those. Uh, they're also important in blueberry pollination, cranberries, uh, pumpkins, watermelons. Uh, so there's a number of, of crops that benefit and do very well with um, bumblebees as pollinators. Again, the sort of solanaceous crops also, while many of them are self-fertile, um, uh, they benefit from uh, insect pollination. So you can get um, higher yields, even though the plant itself um, can produce, uh, can produce uh, fruit without a pollen transfer from one plant to another, uh, they will benefit from being agitated by the bees. Uh, and of course, they, bumblebees have an enormous value to wildlands and wildland pollination. Here's one on, this is a, a balsam ariza uh, plant in the Western US and here's a bumblebee on it getting some pollen. So, um, but we don't really have a good number of, that we can put on value for wildlands because it's not easily quantified. So this is to compare um, pollen foraging. This is, and again, I'll, I'll emphasize this is pollen and not nectar. Um, between honeybees, which is this uh, upper graph, uh, and bumblebees, which is this lower graph. I hope everyone can see my cursor. I can probably um, use a laser pointer here. Um, so here's honeybees up top. Uh, and you can notice that over the course of the season, so we sampled these, we were sampling pollen um, from returning foragers uh, in early July, and then we did it again and sort of later in July, early August. Uh, and then in through the end of August. Um, so these dates roughly line up. They're not exactly the same date, but they're pretty close. Um, and you can see that, um, the, and these were located, I should say, in the same place. We had this honeybee apiary. We put these uh, pollen traps on those. We put pollen traps on the bumblebees that were also located in the, in the apiary. And so they had access to the same plants. They were all in the same locations and we let them go and do their thing. And then we just recorded what they brought back into the colonies. And these are proportions of pollen foraged um, from these large uh, groups. So the gray down at the bottom is just sort of the random stuff where we didn't have a lot of pollen represented for those plant families. But these plant families up top the, are the ones that, that comprise most of the diet. And um, for honeybees um, throughout the year, Asteraceae was very, um, very important. Uh, when mints bloomed, they were, they were very important. Um, and, um, and then they did other things which were interesting, like Poaceae and people would be like, why are they going to, um, uh, grass, uh, to get pollen? And, and the reason is that this is when the corn blooms, uh, and honeybees like to forage on corn. Um, so they bring in a lot of corn pollen. 
Uh, and then there's other things, you know, the, 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 the P family and the Fibaceae here, they're, they're going to those as well. But Asteraceae takes up a huge proportion of their diet. Um, uh, and, and that was really interesting to us to see that Brassicaceae is a little important at some times early in the season for sure. For the bumblebees, at the same time points, we can see where, where P, the P family, Poaceae, is just so important, or sorry, Fabaceae is important throughout the entire season. Uh, and then we also were surprised that we see um, a little bit of rosaceae, not too much, but this is solanaceae. So this is that, um, you know, the tomatoes, peppers, et cetera, that, that family, the nightshade family, um, a huge portion of the diet. And um, again, this is pollen, which is accessible really through buzz pollination. And so this could be native nightshades, or I should say wild nightshades, not necessarily native, um, but it can also be um, plants that are grown as, as uh, garden crops and stuff. These, these bees certainly had access to those. Um, and so we found this really interesting that, that you can see while they have access to the same things, they don't necessarily forage on the same things. There is some overlap um, here, the Asteraceae definitely and the, and the um, Fabaceae uh, are both part of the diet at these time periods, but the proportion is different and the bees are selecting different things when given the, the opportunity. And this was work that a student of mine, Houston Judd, did. So he um, he was the one who did all this pollen identification. We only took it to plant family here simply because we're doing it uh, with the microscope, you know, through microscopy and not looking at the molecular um, determination of what pollen was there. Uh, so with a microscope, it's often hard to tease apart exactly what pollens you're looking at um, within a plant family because they tend to be similar. Um, some cases you can tell them apart, others you can't. So we just summarize the data here as plant families. Uh, this is another study that's part of, uh, and um, we, we essentially what we did here was we went through old museum collections and um, you know, there'd be bees that people have caught and pinned and put into museums. And a lot of those have pollen on their legs. We were really interested in this uh, bee, which is federally listed as endangered, um, called the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, the rusty patch bumblebee is native to Ohio. It's it's hasn't been seen in Ohio in, in a decade or so. Um, and um, we were curious what what did it eat? What did it used to eat historically? And does it like still eat those same things? Well, we don't know if it still eats those same things because those studies are now ongoing. Um, but we took a bunch of rusty patch bumblebees that have been caught uh, throughout the Great Lakes region. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, and we removed pollen from them. Uh, and we then did a metabarcoding uh, using the, the DNA to, uh, to see what sources those pollen came from. Uh, and this is you know, a list of sometimes uh, species, sometimes uh, genera, sometimes families of pollen um, that we found. And, um, and we looked at native versus introduced plants. And you can see that this bee, tended to feed on um, a lot of different stuff. It had a pretty broad diet, some of which was native, uh, and some of the natives are really important, uh, and, and some of which were introduced, and things like melilotus, um, you know, sweet clover, which is definitely not a native, but it is uh, pretty widespread, and the bees find it to be a, a pretty good food source. Um, and so, this is just to show that that, that native uh, introducing the bees are not discriminating necessarily. They're choosing a diet based on what they want. Um, and it, it may not necessarily, uh, uh, doesn't have to be native for native bumblebees to like it. Uh, and this is one more study from Anthony Vado. This just came out last year. Um, and I'll, I'll try to summarize it pretty quickly. There's a lot going on here, but essentially what they looked at was the lipid content of various pollens and the uh, protein content of various pollens. And so when you take pollen, it's got, it's got these fats and these proteins in it, and there's a ratio of those. So some are fattier and others are more proteinaceous uh, as a ratio. And it turns out that bees, various species of bees will select different ratios of lipid to protein in their pollen. Bumblebees are over here. This little uh, diamond is bumblebees. This diamond is Osmia cornifrons. And this green diamond is honeybees. And what this is showing is that plants 
and here's the plant again, plant families out here. Um, plants have different lipid to protein ratios. So this one, for example, has lots of lipid to protein. So quite fatty, liliaceae. And if you, um, but if you look out here at say Plantagenaceae, it's, it has a much higher protein to lipid content. And bumblebees tend to select higher protein content over lipid content. Whereas honeybees are just totally happy having this, um, having fattier uh, content. So there's probably really important reasons for this. And, and we, the other thing we, that, I, that we don't necessarily know is if this ratio changes throughout the season or if this is uh, one thing that's pretty static and they're always selecting for this. And the other thing to consider is that when they don't have choices of food, then they tend to go with whatever's available, whether it's the one they want or not. This was really one where Anthony provided uh, the bees with a, with a lot of different choices and then recorded which things they chose. Um, and some of this I think comes from the literature as well. It's not just stuff that they did, but uh, it's stuff that's out there. So the, um, the important thing is that the different bee species are choosing different things. And the other thing to consider is this is one bumblebee species that he's got in this data set. So there may in fact be choices that are made differently from one bumblebee species to another. And I think we actually know that that's fairly true. And then one, you know, this is another uh, bit of research that's currently ongoing, or, you know, I should say ongoing. This was recently published, but this group is still working on, on understanding. Um, and there's other groups too, looking at food as medicine in bees. And so we know that bees can choose um, different pollens and different nectars, and they may do that as a way to medicate against uh, disease and infections. And so this is just showing, this is, um, uh, in this study, they had this pollen uh, in white, this was, um, or sorry, no pollen. So they didn't feed any pollen to the bees uh, and they looked at nosema um, counts. So they were just giving the bees um, sugar solution uh, so that they could stay alive. And, and nosema is this, uh, uh, fungal disease that gets inside of the bee guts. So they were doing, okay, how much uh, nosema did they have? If they didn't get any pollen and if they got buckwheat pollen, they had a lot more nosema, but if they got this sunflower pollen, it seems to decrease the amount of nosema they have relative to this other pollen source. So, um, so certain pollens seem to be uh, important in controlling disease within a colony. Um, So uh, what are preferred foods? And I, you know, I've thrown a lot of different things that are going on out there at you. And then this is the, the end all, so I'll wrap up here. Um, and I think the reality is preferred foods are kind of context dependent. So it's critical where you are and when you are there. Uh, and, and that's one of the things. So obviously bees can't forage on flowers that either aren't in that region or aren't currently available. So they've either stopped blooming or haven't started blooming. Um, so, so timing is really important. Um, and as well as the other uh, plants that are in the area. So in some cases, they're gonna prefer one thing over another. And, and, and in some cases, um, you know, as I say in the bottom here, it's probably driven by abundance and proximity. So if you have a lot of low quality flowers that are close to the hive, they may choose those over a higher quality source, which is slightly further away. And we don't really know how those decisions are made. Um, or if they even really do make those decisions much. But the families that we see recurring over and over again in bumblebee diets uh, tend to be, um, you know, these four are really important from what we've seen. Um, there may be others out there that are, uh, that are also, um, again, contextually important. So certain species in certain environments may prefer other things that we, that we didn't see in these sort of uh, more generalist um, settings. So there are a lot of things that are driving uh, what a bee chooses to be on. And, um, and anyway, with that, I'm going to stop the slideshow and I think we can chat. We got about a half an hour or so. Uh, happy to take questions. Great. So folks, if you have a question and you want to put it in the chat pod, that's fine. But we're also a small enough group. So if you want to just type two question marks into the chat box, then we'll just, uh, um, you know, if you'd rather speak your question, we can do it that way. 
And uh, Jamie, while we're working on that, I, I did want to ask you, I think I've asked you this before, but it sometimes comes up and I forgot to pull it up. So I can't remember if it's a Forest Service document or who put the document out. It was a Rusty Patch Bumblebee um, plant list and it mentions superfoods, uh, which I know we've talked about before is, you know, what is this idea of superfood and is it really a thing or just kind of a, uh, an idea? Um, so do you, do you remember that? Um, seeing that Jamie or uh yeah I do and I'm trying to remember um what was on it like what plants we, were on it. yeah which plants I'll, I'll I'll look here and see if I can um see if I can pull it up I know I mentioned it before to um uh, Karen Goodell and uh Randy Mitchell and they're like mm, not really so sure what this idea of uh the superfoods uh was oh good and then uh um Kathy has a question in the chat box I too. See that. Okay, so can the comment on practice beekeepers taking all the honey produced by honeybees and giving them corn syrup? Do you think some honey should be left for them? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's, uh, I mean, I can comment on it. I've, I've got honeybees myself and I've had honeybees for 25 years now or so. So, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of kind of leaving uh, you know, a couple boxes of their honey for them, um, but, I think commercial beekeepers are making decisions which are not necessarily driven by, I mean, obviously they don't want to hurt their bees, but, um, but they make decisions which are driven by economics. And so if they can do something that's going to make more money, um, that's often what leads to that. I, you know, my preference is that bees should have the diet they collect is, you know, I think probably the best thing. And there's, I think, some other issues with like high fructose corn syrup and um, some compounds that come off from that. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, Kathy. Yeah, Jamie, I did find the. Um, let me go this one, and then Bob will take your question. But let me, I did find this um, Forest Service reference here, and it does say that bumblebee superfoods and or immune building plants. So do you have any, uh, is, this, is this bee snake oil talk here or do we actually have uh, bee immune building plants? Yeah, well, you know, so that's, so it's interesting. I think when you do, so we know that diet's important in, in immune response um, and, and for bees. So that one uh, figure I showed, I didn't go into it too deeply um, with, the, with the sunflower versus the buckwheat pollen. It shows that even though sunflowers, um, even though the bees that are eating sunflower pollen have slightly higher nosema levels, they actually um, have a lower death rate, uh, death hazard ratio than, than bees that don't get any pollen. So having some pollen is important in maintaining that nutrition. You can tolerate a higher uh, pathogen load is if you're getting good nutrition. And that's sort of the take home message with that is that, that actually having a good diet is important. Um, you know, you could have a really sub, uh, substandard diet, not have any pathogens, but you're still gonna get sick because um, you need the good food. So yeah, I think there are, you know, there's also some other things like there's a lot of flower, flowers that produce um, like tobaccos and things like that that produce um, uh, nicotine in, the, um, in their nectars. And so, um, there's also some evidence that bees that have infections will preferentially forage nectar from these plants that are excreting compounds that, you know, have, again, like these are probably um, impacting those pathogen levels. Uh, and we think that's why the bees prefer nectars that have things like, and, and there's artificial things they've done, like adding caffeine and nicotine and these compounds tend to kill things, right? Um, so at least at high levels. So the bees seem to be knowing that and going to those to uh, help control it. So there is some idea that there are these foods that actually help them. Um, the, the, there are nectars and pollens that actually help them. Um, so there may be superfoods. I don't know that we know enough about any of these things at this point to really say like, well, we should just plant a whole bunch of this and it'll make the bees um, healthy. Uh, Bob uh, typed out his question. So do adult bumblebees eat pollen or do they collect it only to feed to their larvae? So yeah, Bob, they do actually um, eat pollen. They ingest a certain amount of it. It's not a lot, uh, not, not you know, relative to uh, larvae. So the larvae, most of what they eat is, is pollen. 
uh, with a little bit of nectar in there. With adults, they're eating a little bit of pollen with a lot of nectar, uh, unless you are the queen bumblebee, in which case you're eating a fair amount of pollen because um, the queens are, you know, they're producing eggs and eggs take a lot of protein to produce. So they're gonna eat a fair amount of uh, pollen. But the, the workers themselves, if you, when we do studies and we're dissecting bees to get pathogens out of their guts, you'll see that they have, some of them have a fair amount of pollen in their guts, but it's not their main food source, but they do need some. Uh, Superfoods reference. I have heard about mushroom mycelium that they have been feeding on, or feeding to honeybees. Uh, do you know anything about this? Uh, yeah, so this is um, a study that's actually, this is kind of fun because um, my PhD advisor, uh, when I did my PhD, uh, and this guy called uh, named Paul Stamens, who's a mushroom specialist out in Washington State, they've been working on this uh, mu mushroom mycelium uh, thing for a while. And there may be other groups that are doing it too, but I know about what they're doing. So they've been taking... Um, and I can't remember what mushroom it is, but there's uh, one of the mushrooms, they, they actually add this mycelium to the, uh, to the sugar water when they feed the bees and they show lower viral loads. Um, so, you know, honeybees have a bunch of viruses for those of you that don't know. Um, and um, the, the bees that get the mycelium have a lower viral load than bees that don't get fed the mushroom mycelium. Again, is there some significant compound in the mycelium or is there a nutritional benefit from having mushroom mycelium, which have you know, proteins and things in them uh, and fats that, that maybe are helping the bees nutritionally? So I think, I think that's still uh, out for debate, uh, what it is about the mycelium that's helping the bees, but it does seem to have an impact on bee health. Uh, Jamie, you mentioned seeing a, a queen out recently, and um, sometimes I get questions from folks about queens that are seen, you know, even a, a month or um, six weeks from now, and um, sometimes just kind of crawling around. Can you talk about what sometimes happens to those um, those queens? Yeah. So um, yeah. So so a couple things. Uh, there are you know a number of species, and some of them will emerge early in the season, and some emerge slightly later in the season from hibernation to form the nest. So you do see, tend to see a long period of time when queens are available across all species. A given species may only have a month or so of queen emergence that, that it's out. And then you have some individuals which tend to sort of, you'll see queens out very late in the year. And if you look at them on flowers, sometimes you'll see that their wings look tattered. I say late in the year. So we're talking like late June, early July. Um, so it's, too early for the fall queens, um, but it's kind of late for the spring queens. Um, and so the tattered wings is always a good sign um, when you start seeing them out very late that these bees are not gonna nest. Um, and sometimes, as you said, they'll be crawling around and that can happen again with excessive wing wear, the bees stop, get to a point where they just can't fly much anymore. Um, but there are, there is one really kind of cool thing, at least I think it's cool because I love parasites, uh, but there's a parasite of bumblebee queens. Uh, it's a nematode that gets in and it actually gets in, it's called a queen castrating nematode, but what it does is it affects the queen's behavior such that she won't start a nest. So if, if the queen's uh, infected with these uh, or parasitized by these nematodes, she'll just fly around and forage and forage and forage. Eventually she'll fly back to the, um, the, her overwintering site where she was in the soil uh, and she'll crawl into the ground like she's going to overwinter again and she'll die. And then the nematodes erupt out of her uh, and they colonize more of that overwintering site with the hopes of um, infesting another bumblebee uh, that may come there to winter. So um, I personally think that's one of the coolest things ever that a little nematode can get into a bumblebee and control its behavior. Um, but uh, so sometimes you'll see these queens out and these aren't, aren't uncommon nematodes. So I think in studies we've done, it's, you know, somewhere between two and 5% of queens tend to get infected with these uh, every winter. So uh, we do see those. Uh, then Kathy had another question. Are all bumblebee populations in decline or just certain species? Why are they in decline in certain areas? So yeah, so certain species are much more affected than others by whatever's happening in the world. Um, 
And so, yeah, some species, rusty patch bumblebee is, comes to mind as one of the, the big ones. Um, there's a, a, a couple other species uh, that are also like the uh, American bumblebee, which is um, Bombus pennsylvanicus, is also one that's uh, in decline in a lot of areas. There's probably a lot of factors that drive this, Kathy. Um, some of those are, we know, are related to diseases uh, and diseases that, you know, frankly, humans are responsible for moving around. Uh, as we move bees commercially, we tend to move the, uh, everything that infects them. Um, and so whether those are, are honeybees, honeybees and bumblebees share a lot of diseases, so we can have impacts that way. Bumblebees are, you know, have been reared commercially, and we know that there are diseases, disease outbreaks that have been traced to bumblebee uh, rearing facilities. Um, so those could be sources of things. And then, uh, you know, just anything that we're moving as we move um, crops or plant material around, things like that, we, we can move, um, we can move bees and their diseases with them. So, um, so those diseases, one of the main drivers of bumblebee um, disappearance and, um, much, much like it is with honeybees. So if you look at honeybee uh, losses, a lot of those are driven by, you know, varroa mites or viruses or nosema, you know, so there's all these things that, that kind of impact bees. Um, and it's the same with bumblebees, uh, that they get impacted by a lot of diseases as well. Uh, and then habitat loss is pretty critical for bumblebees. You know, unlike honeybees, we can't pick up the colonies and move them of, not of all the species anyway. Um, so if, if somebody, you know, if you have a bumblebee colony that's developing and someone comes in and, and um, uh, you know, paves over a parking lot next to it and takes out a bunch of floral resources, the bees, they just have to deal with that. So they, they are, they do tend to be susceptible to, um, more susceptible to short-term uh, habitat changes than say, uh, than, than honeybees would be if we can, if we can move them in. And again, pesticide, same thing, like you can't close up a bumblebee wild hum bumblebee colony at night um, where you might be able to close up your honeybees when the when the farmer is going to spray and so uh, they they are kind of exposed to a lot of things so habitat pesticides pathogens climate uh, we have evidence that climate change is is pushing us uh, populations uh, in southern populations are disappearing um, we don't necessarily see a lot of movement to the north up, up in Canada but um, there's there seems to be some some reactions to that as well. Uh, and, and certainly in the Western US, we have evidence, some really cool studies done looking at how bumblebee populations are moving up mountains as the mountains, as it gets hotter. So they continue to move up to stay in this climate zone that they're comfortable with. Um, so there's a lot of stuff doing it, uh, affecting bumblebee populations. We estimate about 20% of the species of those 50 species, about 20% um, in the United States are in decline or in North America are in decline. So um, yeah, there's there's a number of species that are at risk uh, and a lot of projects looking at monitoring them and rehabilitating them. Uh, oh, uh, Diane, I think this was a follow-up on the mushroom question. The research names uh, Paul Stamens, S-T-A-M-E-N-T-S, -E I think. And uh, Steve Shepard, S H E P P A R D. You know, the guy's doing the mycelium work. And there's probably some other folks working with him. Those are the two I know. Bumblebee plant project. I noted that there were many uh, more pictures of bees on common in some. Uh, yeah, so the question is, is are, are, when you see a lot of these on sort of um, non-native species, in some cases invasive plants, um, is, this, uh, is this about abundance or is it about preference? And I think, you know, it's a great question, Petra. I think you're, it is largely, abundance is really important. So um, where you see a lot of a concentration of plants, it, whether those are in, uh, invasive or native, um, you will see the bees tend to congregate on the common plants. Um, and I think bees, just like us, are very uh, susceptible to the habit of finding something they like uh, that is an acceptable food source and returning to that over and over again. Um, so they will exploit uh, a plant until it runs out. <clears throat> um, and, uh, 
and they and we know like bees are highly trainable um, to to different uh, plant colors or to different flower shapes. And so once a bee work, learns how to work a flower, they will tend to go back to those similar flowers over and over again. Uh, like I said, until it runs out. So yeah, if, if you have abundance, high abundance of things, even if it's you know not a native, um, they'll go to it. Uh, and, and, um, and I think when you look at these, like often there's a native component. So you may have a, an invasive plant and, and a native plant, the bees will just simply, you know, if they have say two, two plants that are, you know, clovers and one's a native or maybe, maybe a, like a lupin or something, one's a native and one's an invasive that they don't care, right? To them, they're both just lupins. And once they learn how to work one lupin flower, they'll go to the other one just as easily. So whatever becomes more abundant is the one that they'll choose. Um, so yeah, I don't think that has to do with preference for invasives and non-natives as much as it is just availability for them. And so I think, you I can think easily... if, if I can, if I can jump yeah. into Jamie, I think it's also one of the biases on iNaturalist and why it's a good observational tool, but it's not a research tool, right? So it's what people commonly see when you have your phone out, when it's nice, when you're out, you know, 10 feet from your car. So it's common plants, um, easy to photograph. So we're not getting a lot of the high canopy visitation, you know, a lot of that is missed on iNaturalist. So it is just kind of, you know, what's easy when I have my camera out and it's nice and I, we grow a lot of purple cone flowers. And so we, we get that a lot. Um, one of the plants that I think is so cool from, um, the, from the, um, Randy Mitchell and Karen Goodell's uh, bumblebee survey uh, over two summers is that crown vetch came up and just what Jamie was saying, like crown vetch, we would never say that crown vetch is a, a good bee plant or that we would see a lot of bumblebees on crown vetch, but because they in part were serving roadsides because the funder was ODOT, right? And they wanted to know who's foraging on roadsides. There's a lot of crown vetch on roadsides. There's a lot of crown vetch. And if there's not a lot of other food, you know, you're on the interstate and all there is is McDonald's, I guess, you know, you're getting chicken McNuggets. Yeah, that's, it's like the great analogy, you know, um, you're not going to drive five miles off the interstate if you're on a trip, right? You're, you're going to go to what's right there. Um, and uh, even if it's, maybe not what you'd want it's what you have so you take it um yeah i think and then that's you know and that sort of goes back to this idea of like restoration and and like planting things that um you know that, that are that are both native but also that are desirable for the bees if you have big enough patches of those you see bees on it um and so but one or two isolated plants they may not choose to go to that frequently because they just have to learn that and by the time they learn it it's done blooming. Um, and I, and I would say like, I think the canopy issue is also another interesting one, Denise, because, uh, you know, I, I know you can see a lot of bumblebees foraging um, on, on a number of trees, but they're really hard to photograph uh, when, they're, when they're 15 feet up. Um, you can see them, but you just can't get a good picture of them. So uh, it's another question. I sometimes see medium sized bumblebees in the spring and fall. Could these be queens? And how do you tell them from workers? Uh, so the real thing with bumblebees is queens are just bigger than workers. There's no, it, with a few exceptions, there's no real, um, you know, physical difference that you can see with your eyeball other than size. Um, so th that's, you know, that's, uh, yeah. So medium size, there's a couple possibilities um, depending on what you mean by medium size. Uh, the, the queens are going to be larger than workers, but they also um, will sometimes, some species, you have slightly smaller queens uh, than others. And so those can be a little confusing if you have bit, some big queens out and about, and then this other species pops up, you might be like, oh, is that a worker? It's a bit smaller. Um, so that could be what you're seeing is just a different species where they're not quite as big as the other ones. Um, and then, you know, in the fall, the other thing you might get are males. Sometimes males can be pretty big. Uh, and, um, but those would be ones you would see in the fall that would be a pretty large, uh, individual out and about that would be bigger than a worker. Do bumblebees go back to same overwintering sites? Yes. Uh, we, we think pretty much that's, uh, what happens with most species. So, um, the, the so, so that's why these nematodes are, you know, effective at finding hosts is because the bees tend to choose the same sites. 
we have no idea how they choose these sites. Um, there's some speculation that they like north facing slopes versus south facing slopes and um, uh, you know, because people found them in road cuts and things like that, where they're like, oh, well, they're always on the north facing side, but not the south facing side. And, and you would think that would be because they would want less sunlight directly on the soil to get them to heat it up too early in the year, you know, when the snow melts and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, that we don't really know how they pick sites, what there's, is there a soil type they like? Is there uh, some kind of tree cover, or not tree cover? We don't know, it does have to be bare soil. Um, some species we know nests tend to overwinter near where their nest sites were um, and others, um, we just don't know. We have no idea where they go, so. Uh, yeah. Is, Queen, is do, Queen Quest kind of ongoing, the community science project? That's a good, yeah, that's a good question. So we, it was two years Queen Quest has happened. Um, the Queen Quest is this project that uh, a couple of folks started to, um, to go track uh, bumblebee queens in the fall and try to find them. And so we have a, a short protocol. You make a one meter by one meter area and you essentially clear off the topsoil, um, slowly digging down um, and, uh, and see if you can find queen bumblebees uh, in the soil there. I had with a couple of my students last year, we did a put together a queen quest team and we dug something like 20 uh, one meter by one meter squares up in the uh, in Chadwick Arboretum and we didn't find any queens. So, um, so that was uh, a little sad, uh, but you know, we found spots where they weren't. And uh, so I guess that's a success. <laughs> Other questions anybody has? This is your chance. We've got a few minutes left. Oh, there's one from Donna. Let's go over to Bumblebee Nest and an old wren hanging bird box. She probably won't overwinter in the box, in the, in the birdhouse. Um, they'll probably leave in the fall. The new queens will leave mate and then find a spot in the soil. Most what we know about bumblebees overwintering is most of them overwinter underground. Um, we don't have a lot of records of people finding them in other places. Um, I found them in like, you know, uh, window wells and um, things like that, but generally not up in trees or something like that. So yeah, she'll, she'll probably leave that birdhouse. Uh, well, the, the new queens will leave that birdhouse and find a different place. But that's fairly common. Wrens, uh, chickadees seem to be um, pretty, uh, will be displaced. They've actually been kicked out of nests by bumblebees. Um, the bumblebee queens can actually uh, remove a chickadee from a bird, a birdhouse pretty fast. So hey. Sam Drogi and I were discussing that this spring, the phenomenon of birds being evicted by bees. Other questions? I'll, um, I'll ask you a question that I've gotten uh, twice, actually in the last couple of days, Jamie, which is about moving bumblebee colonies, a uh, couple of people who have found them near sidewalks, so, you know, close to entryways, they're doing work or don't want them there. And um, um, how successful um, have, have you had any, any experience moving them? I understand they're qu pretty difficult to relocate. They can't, yeah, they can be. They can be really hard to relocate. Um, the, so I, but I do, there was a guy who used to, I sort of went and worked with him a bit one summer because he was really good at this. He uh, he actually had a business where he would remove bumblebee nests. And then, um, and a lot of them he was getting out of birdhouses. Uh, that was a lot of what he did was remove them from people's birdhouses for them. But he would take them out from all sorts of spaces. He, the one issue is like they're in the ground and sometimes they'll get, you know, you'll, they'll nest um, in old rodent burrows. And um, I'll say the one, I tried once to like dig one out and um, it, I could never find the nest. The tunnel just kept going and going and going. And then it went below um, this concrete pad. And I'm like, well, I'm not moving that. So, uh, so it depends where they are. Uh, if they're, uh, I've taken them out of, you know, like a, again, like a window well or an irrigation box, um, or, or someone once had one in their um, hot tub control box, control panel, and I was able to get that one out pretty easily. Um, if they're if if they're 
in a nook or a cranny like that, you can often pull it out. But if they're below the soil surface, they can be really hard to get out and successfully move. Um, so one thing we have done is you can, you know, modify the entrance. So if they're coming up right next to a sidewalk, you might consider putting a pipe in that leads away from the sidewalk. Um, so they have to come up through the pipe and then head out. But um, yeah, they can they can be really tricky if if uh, if they're below the ground. Your chances of success are pretty low at moving them. All right. Well, we're uh, right about on time, and I want to be respectful of your time, Jamie. So, um, folks, thanks for for jumping in, Jamie. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us, uh, guys. I know Jamie would appreciate a. Uh, thank you, a shout out in the chat box. Really appreciate your time and your expertise. And we'll see you again on uh, on Friday at, uh, uh, at 10 for the B short course. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me.